Um, thanks for getting back on time uh, so we can stick to our schedule. Um, our team has mentioned time traveling. We're going to continue doing that. And a little bit, a subtle bit of space traveling even, I would say. And time shuffling. Uh, we're going to have to reverse the order of the presentations because there's a technical thing. So Ludwig is fetching an alternative device. So we're going to start with uh, Deirdre Fini, who uh, comes all the way from Australia, who um, has, has a wonderful website, by the way. I'm not sure how much you're going to show of your other works. Then, and I hope you all have seen, if not, go and see and experience uh, the work she's installed as a presentation of one of her many recent works that play with glass and magic lantern uh, technology. Uh, Deirdre is also a lecturer of contemporary art at the University of South Australia, is a member of the Australian Research Centre for Interactive and Virtual Environments, and if I understand correctly, I mean, it's mentioned you have a background in glass making, and you can see from the website a lot of intriguing sculptural objects that you've made, but now they've become more dynamic installations. Um, so please welcome Deirdre Fini. Good morning, everyone. Um, just before I start, I'd like to just extend a really warm thank you to the whole Be Magic team for such an engaging and really considered conference. So thank you. <laughs> Visual culture historians Jill Cassid and Jonathan Carey claim that there is little to distinguish the magic lantern from its precursory apparatus of the camera obscura. However, my explorations as an artist and practice-led researcher have led me to view them as distinct optical systems, with the most notable difference between them being the image source. This image source is what optical physicists term the object, and what is of course known in the world of the magic lantern as the glass slide. Around the time that Christian Huygens placed his glass slide in between a composite set of lenses in 1694, new understanding of lenses were emerging, which eventually led to the development of the principle of optical equivalence. This principle states that an object and a projected image are optically or mathematically equivalent. Perhaps Huygens' placement of the glass slide into his image system was an experiment to materially test this principle, to investigate if a translucent material object can optically function in the same way as a refracted or projected image. But even if this speculation is off the mark, the introduction of the image source in the form of the glass slide, I would argue, clearly demonstrates a methodological shift in both the practical and theoretical understanding of optical image formation. The image, the image source and optical image formation is the focus of the practice-led projects I will share with you in this presentation. I'll elaborate on some of my practical experimental iterations that have emerged from expanding the form and function of the glass slide within my optical systems, which are all based on the optical premise of the lantern. In place of the glass slide, featuring a two-dimensional painted or printed image, I wanted to, to experiment with using a translucent 3D object to explore how that would affect the projected image. As an experienced glass maker, I knew how to control the specific dimensions and opacity of the glass object to allow certain amounts of light travel through the object from my light source, which was a high lumens LED. For a previous artwork, Ghost in the Machine, I had experimented with kiln firing glass decals onto microscope glass slides to create image objects for my moving ghost. Decals are produced by inkjet printing images onto clear substrate that burns off in the kiln, leaving only the ink, which in this case is a liquid glass glaze of low viscosity. I had also experimented with creating 2D glass slides by screen printing various glass powders onto clear glass substrates and testing various kiln temperatures to produce an optimal translucency for the projected image. The colour saturation and the lens effect of the kiln-fired glass powders were striking when projected, but it's really challenging to control the image due to the glass powder wanting to 
always move away from the printed edge. And the images you see here are some of the early tests that were produced using nanofabricated glass patterns developed by Dr. Yun Lu Wei at the Optics Fabrication Lab at the University of Adelaide. And we're continuing to uh, do some more work in this space to develop a kind of proper set of glass slides and projected images. But as I mentioned, I was interested in exploring the 3D image object in place of the 2D glass slide and how that would affect the image. So I began by cold working and constructing a 3D empty space object in ruby red glass. But when I placed this object into my optical system, I was disappointed by the lack of depth in the projected image. It seemed that although I had varied the material thickness of the form, the uniformity of the colored glass somehow optically and visually flattened the image. So instead, I modeled up and printed some empty space objects, first using a filament printer, and then later a resin stereolithography or SLA printer. And my initial intention for these printed models was to produce a form from which I could create a mold and then cast in glass. But during this process, I decided to test these printed objects in my optical system. So the results from the FDM printer were mixed, but the SLA prints produced projected images with a depth of field that I had not previously seen, been able to obtain in my ex experiments with more traditional glass making methods. The SLA printing process uh, comprises of a laser solidifying liquid resin layer by layer. So this specific process just so happens to produce the right translucency in the pr printed object, allowing the light from the LED source travel through the object, objective lens, and onto the screen to create the protected image. Optically, these 3D printed forms sit halfway between the overly opaque prints produced by the filament printer and the clear perfection of the glass forms I had cold worked and constructed by hand. Another specific element in these experiments is that the process of how the projected images are generated is, is made explicit. Not only can the viewer see the entire system of how the image is generated, the projected image also visually reveals its own process of making. The strata lines of the layers of solidified resin are visible in the image, and in my case are integral to its aesthetic, reading as patchy lines on a rendered concrete wall like in a physically constructed building. In this way, the projected images of my contemporary lantern systems reveal the digitally coded processes of how these image objects are both formed and perceived. When developing this series of image objects suggestive of empty or abandoned architectural spaces, I applied my knowledge of cast glass into the modeling of the forms to further explore the appearance of depth of field in the projected image. For example, where I wanted more light to appear in the image, I significantly reduced the thickness of the object to allow more light travel through it. But where I wanted a heightened depth of field, I increased its thickness on the different X, Y, and Z planes of the model. So by engaging with this process, I could experiment with different focal planes within the same image. For example, a traditional glass slide with a painted or printed translucent image has a single focal plane, that of the image on the glass substrate, and consequently it projects an image in 2D. Whereas the the images I've developed generate a projected image across three-dimensional space using an additional spatial geometric axis. So when the light travels from the LED through the image object, objective lens, and onto the screen or the wall, the depth of field is further accentuated by the fact that the image source, being a three-dimensional form, has more than one focal plane. The objective lens, of course, it can't accommodate two different planes simultaneously in focus. So this allows me to focus the foreground of the image object while the background remains slightly blurred, heightening the illusionary depth of field in the image. And when I first exhibited these projected image experiments, I noticed several viewers attempting to place their hands into the empty spaces, only to recoil quickly when their hand met a solid wall, realizing that the spatial depth of the image was but an illusion created through materiality and light. And then while playing around with the position of the objective lens to establish the foreground of the projected image, I noticed that the position of the image source relative to the objective lens significantly changed the appearance of the projected image. 
To explore this change of image further, I worked with Matthew Bailey, a final year electronics student at the University of South Australia, to add sensing capability to the systems. As the sensor detects the presence or movement of the viewer engaging with the work, the object image is transported along the image axis by a stepper motor, consequently changing the appearance of the projected image. Using an infrared proximity sensor, the newly added interactivity makes the viewer complicit in the generation, form, and perception of the image. Recently, I've also further explored this concept of depth of field by adding optical mirrors into my image systems. And I'm currently investigating if it's possible to create a system that can materially generate a moving image from a single static 2D image source. So working in collaboration with microengineer Mark Sherrill and photonics physicist Dr. Dale Otten at the University of uh, South Australia, we've developed nanofabricated mirror components to control refracted light from a 2D translucent image slide so that it adds an apparent depth of field in its projected image. And so here again, I'm using this notion of multiple focal planes. I've used nanofabrication to cut and optically polish 3D patterns into the mirrors. So now it becomes a 3D object rather than a 2D mirror plane. But where previously my 3D printed objects pr uh, produced a focused back uh, foreground and a blurred background, the combined mirror and image slide projections here require the reflected image from the mirror and the refracted image from the slide to both be out of focus. And changing the relative position of each of these components allows me to play with the depth of field in the image. Throughout these projected image projects, I've discovered how different lenses from different eras change the aesthetic of the projected image light. I had gathered a range of historical and contemporary lenses in my studio and was predominantly testing 3D uh, image objects using a magic lantern objective lens dating from the late 19th or early 20th century. So I was pretty surprised when I used contemporary lenses in place of the historical lens and the projected images were, were quite different. So where the magic lantern lens had produced a softer image, these newer lenses with greater magnification and sharper focus somehow deconstructed the illusion of the magical image appearing in 3D, flattening out the illusionary space where all I could see was the visual representation of the printed object. I was no longer perceptually transported to the space of the image in and of itself. And I found this transformation of the image compelling, where the same object could create an aesthetically different image simply by using an older and newer lens, and how this affected my actual experience of the image. I reflected on the extent to which the material of glass changes the invisible transfer of light to mediate the perception of our world, and how our perception of the image, therefore, is so dependent upon the optical technologies of our time. Reminiscent of Crary's observation that our visionary experiences have never been apprehended in some pure state, they're always mediated in some way by technical, material, or cultural practices. The materiality of image making is an important consideration in my various projects and was one of the main reasons I was first drawn to the Magic Lantern. I remember hearing the collective gasp from the audience in one of Martin Jolly's Magic Lantern performances in Canberra, where young art school students, being digital natives, have predominantly only encountered the image in the form of digital pixels on a screen. The specific materiality of the image source and its engagement with light generates a very different image to that of screen-based images, which obviously we all know here. Um, ironically, the centuries-old technology of the magic lantern generates new experience of the image for contemporary audiences. And this is also evidence in aspects of what is described as the material turn, where media artists are increasingly engaging with media archaeology and the materiality of the image to create works that have a kind of post-digital aesthetic. And it's in this context that my optical image experiments strive to bring a contemporary validity to the magic lantern by exploring new methodologies for optical components and ways of revealing the technology through renewed materiality. Akin to Christian uh, Paul's use of the term neo-materiality, the digitally fabricated objects in my work, they're not an end in themselves. So rather than being solely concerned with what emerging fabrication technologies can produce per se, 
The making of the image objects forms only part of my bespoke systems, which serve to critically engage the viewer. So can this new coded materiality intertwined with the historical optics of the lantern make evident how it and other technologies influence how we experience images? Well, I don't know the answer to that question yet, but I do know that in a world of decreasing sensory experience, where lanter the lantern and its tributary systems allow for a rematerialized and therefore more embodied experience of the image, and that in our current data-driven world, that this is perhaps worth contemplating. And just finally, I want to address how the historical lantern, hidden in plain sight by the viewer attending exclusively to the projected image, differs from my exposed mechanism. I briefly explore how expanding the attention of the viewer to establish a system featuring the device, as well as the image and viewer, serves to heighten sensory engagement with this magical apparatus and bring attention to how images are technologically mediated to affect our perceptual and emotional experience. So there are, of course, two main differences between the magic lantern and my system. The first is the positioning of the optical apparatus. As you know, the magic lantern is normally positioned behind the audience who watch spellbound by the luminous image projected in front of them. And in this way, the lantern renders itself invisible by directing the audience's attention exclusively on the image. And contrastingly, in my optical system, the device forms a visible part of the overall installation where the viewer freely engages with and attends to the device generating the image as well as the image itself. The second difference is that where the magic lantern has a performing lanternist to change the slides and create the image effects, my optical system is a non-human performer, materially and optically generating its projected image. And with the recent addition of sensing capability to my systems, my viewer inadvertently engages in this performance. So my experimental practice therefore proposes a new ontology for the device within the overall image system. Purposely exposing the device serves to draw the attention to the notion that images don't just magically appear before us. But this isn't to destroy the magic of the lantern's projected image light. It serves to critically engage audiences regarding how we see what we see in our technologically mediated world. By relocating the experience of the image towards material and aesthetic strangeness in the 21st century, I'm attempting to awaken the viewer from a kind of perceptual and cognitive slumber around how visible image technologies impact our everyday. I'm endeavoring to bring attention to the materiality of optical image formation, which experienced that tumultuous shift when Huygens placed his glass slide in his magic lantern over 300 years ago. Thank you. Now I hope Ludwig, yeah, you're here. Come, please, in front. Um, sorry. And let's hope the, I mean, take foregrounding technologies, what basically what you're doing. Um, we're foregrounding technology here as we need to plug in the system uh, because it's not entirely compatible. Um, Ludwig Vogel and Karin Bienek need no introduction to most of you. I mean, there's been some of the most steady um, people on the circuit working, researching, uncovering, and you've been speaking before on Hoffman. So, yeah. There's been such strong conflict nexts. Um, if you prefer, Ludwig, because apparently there's a lot of problems with the sound, which you want to. Oh, no, it, it, it completely did not work. So, it did not work. And I did a proposal if you first start with. Okay, okay, so okay. to do, do a Q&A with the first. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yes, please do so. Yeah, okay, but then I need the microphone. Okay. Just. Um. Okay. So maybe, dear, you can come back to the floor. And um, are there any questions? I mean, fresh after the presentation for Deirdre. Yeah. Um, 
Hi. Um, you spoke um, a lot about this kind of the, the new thing that you were doing with the, the sensor and the interaction with the public. Uh, who, but when, the, when I went to visit it, of course it moved, but I had no... Um, it, I didn't know there was a sensor and that it was because of my movement. So this is your intention or you, in the future you are going to make it more explicit that um, in fact the movement of the public really also changes the... <laughs> Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so my initial intention was to kind of surprise the viewer, like so it's not um, overly explicit, but actually it's been really interesting. Um, I think it's too subtle because I think a lot of the people who have engaged with the work didn't realize that there was a sensing capability. There's also an issue with where the sensors, the infrared sensor is positioned on the work. It needs to be altered and the range needs to be extended, I think. So um, I think that's why I was showing it as an iteration or a work in progress to see how people were engaging with it because my initial intention was to take the viewer by surprise that they're, they, it takes some time to work out that they're actually involved in creating the object to move but perhaps it's a bit too subtle at the moment yet. Any more questions? I was wondering, I mean, questions welcomed. Um, I was reminded when you spoke, uh, the depth, depth of field is a concept you use a lot. Um, it's fantastic how you explain that it's totally relevant and makes a huge difference to use contemporary technology with old lenses, 300 years old lenses, and how, how much a different experience that delivers. Um, we've seen stereopticons, but working with depth in performance, have you come across the phantascope and that with uh, already phantasmagoria, there was this effect of 3D projection, and although that's less with, with uh, glass, then I mean, I think transparency for you, and glass is your point of departure in your art practice. Uh, but have you come across that, this uh, ho kind of holographic projection, 3D holographic? So you mean a stereoscopic where both... Phantoscope is actually, I'm, uh, probably some people in the audience can explain it better than I do, is kind of configuration of lenses where you do get um, the illusion and, and the depth of field of, of uh, opaque objects. You can project opaque objects and, and see them instead of translucent objects. And that was already uh, a technique in place uh, at the time of Robertson. So uh, maybe there's another field there that you can play with and if you want to explore this kind of illusion of depth, which is a very nice comment to all the VR and, and again, contemporary uh, things we have. Yes, Sabine. Thank you very much for your interesting talk. Uh, as Edwin just said, the lantern is so old, and I always wondered whether there is a relation between the lenses they used and the light source they used. Could you explain on this, or comment on it? Thank you. Yeah, so there's, there would definitely be a very direct relationship with, between the light source. In my practice, I've only used LED lighting, um, like I haven't gone and used like candle or gas or um, but that would definitely affect the aesthetic of the image and also the brightness so the brightness has a huge impact on the quality of the image and also um, because it, it would have been seen as an entire system so that would have then changed the focal length or the distance that you could have a lens from say the screen or a wall. So then that would change also the size, the dimension, uh, but definitely the quality and the kind of softness of, of, the, um, of the image as well. Yeah, it would play a really important point. I noticed when I went upstairs to see the Kaiser Panorama, there was discussion about that in terms of the light source that was being currently used and then how it would have been originally and then whether the decisions to make, you know, in terms of do you go, go back to the original source or do you work with what you have? And I guess um, with my work, because it's kind of 
gleaning things from kind of different kind of eras of time and bringing them into the present moment. Um, yeah, I'm, I guess, to me, I'm more interested in the materiality of the lenses from a different time rather than, than the light. People got that. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I would, I would say, I would say it's not, it's not a question of that because, um, because in the time you you have the light source, you know, like so they they were playing with the light source they had, but they were. I mean, I've been focusing more on the optics and the lenses and the making of that and the mathematics behind and how the mathematics was intertwined between the physical making and testing of the lens. So I think the the light source was the thing that was known. It was static. And then they were using that to kind of test out the mathematics, like, you know, their kind of theories or, you know, in, in the making, in the curvature. Because even it goes back to the situation of what was the batch recipe, what was used in the glass. I think so there's a lot of really detailed elements. It's not just a lens. It's like, you know, what was the how much soda lime, how much potassium, how much lead, you know, and um, things like where the lens is, you know, because it, back at the beginning they were still being, you know, uh, ground and polished by hand. How accurate were they? Um, you know, this chromatic aberration. They were still, uh, you know, f trying to find this perfect spherical, which was like, we now know that it's not an ideal shape for a lens anyway. It has to be aspherical. So I think it, it wasn't just about yeah, I think it's not about what came first. They had to have something that was um, static, a known thing, like a known variable, and then they worked around that. And I think light, the light source, was what was the kind of static or known variable, and the optics played around that. Yes. Yeah, sorry, we have a question online. So yeah, I'll please. Read it. Can you read it for me? Oh, yeah, I can read it. We have a question from Peter Homer for, uh, online. And he's asking, have you considered the addition of an iris to increase the depth of field at the cost of brightness? It's a good follow-up question on uh, lighting. But... Yeah, he also has a second question about uh, stereoscopic projection. Yeah, okay. Um, yes, I have played around with using a kind of a, like a diaphragm on the lens. But um, that when I sacrifice brightness, I have to really get super close to the screen or else the, I just lose too much light in the image and that significantly decreases the size of the image. Um, what was the second question? Uh, about, uh, oh, yeah. Projection. Yeah. So, um, so one thing I want to try with these 3D objects is I want to map two objects, one for a left eye and one for a right eye, and project them through a single lens and see what... I just haven't gotten around to it yet. But another thing um, that kind of, make, kind of encouraged me to develop this process was um, with this stereoscopic projection, the viewer has to be, you know, very close to the, the device that enables that kind of left and right eye, or even with, say, for example, you go to the movies and the, the green and red like glasses and I wanted to avoid that. I wanted to see if it could be a shared experience of depth, of field, rather than something that it was just a one-on-one -on -one, um, experience. I've noticed some further questions. Are we still allowed time-wise? Yeah, sure. Okay. okay. Meanwhile, I mean, this is while walking over. Um, there's different forms of, uh, you could also work with mirrors and you put your nose against two mirrors to Avoid the uh, yeah stereo experience. Yeah. Um, the the human brain is hardwired to see meaning in shapes, and uh, what you have here is very hardcore, abstract, sort of Mark Rothko esque, and like in the Guggenheim Museum, sort of hanging there. But then some of the stuff you showed on the screen looked like doors or corridors which brings this whole kind of psychological associations with architecture. Uh, so there's that, which I guess is a bit magic, 
So there's that kind of play too between the associational and the pure, you know, photonic optics and stuff. Is that a thing, something that, that you're thinking about? Um, it's not something I've kind of explicitly kind of thought about. I think working with the kind of empty architectural spaces, it's something I've just intuitively come to. But also I think it's something to do with um, engaging or referencing this idea of perspective in Renaissance painting. Like, you know, that, de that illusionary depth of field and that kind of experimental. So when I think of depth of field, I automatically think architectural space. And I think it's just almost as a testing ground to see, you know, as a kind of testing at the principle or the optical premise, does it work? So, yeah, I haven't, I haven't consciously, like, made that decision or made that connection. Ludwig Vogel and Karin Bienek, two of the most consistent practitioners, and I use the word practitioner now because you do a lot of research, you've been affiliated with several universities over three decades, you've started Illuminago, uh, we have a serpentine dancer on stage, uh, so somebody who you have to reenact in order to understand, I think is probably one of your mottos in, in, in your practice. And now you're bringing us back to experiments by John Carpenter that you have, um, that you're able to show, let's hope. Thank you very much for your you. contribution. <laughs> okay. So, uh, I hope it works now. Uh, I here to, uh, hmm? I here. Okay. So, uh, despite all the tr trouble, can you hear me? Uh, despite uh, of the troubles, some people here had now, it, it, I think it's a general shift, general shift, you will see why. <laughs> I'm quite happy about it. Okay. Our presentation will give a brief overview of a series of media archaeological experiments with improved phantasmagoria lanterns that we conducted in 2020, just one week before the first lockdown, with surviving devices and slides from the early and mid-19th century. The series of experiments was conducted in collaboration with the research project DIMA at the University of Luxembourg, and the historical contacts were investigated together with the research project Per Confi at the Philips University of Marburg. The British optician Philip Carpenter produced eyeglasses, microscopes, and also Sir David Brewster's kaleidoscopes. Under the name Improved Phantasmagoria Lantern, he also produced projection devices for use in well-to-do households, educational institutions, parish halls, or similar places. Projection devices of this type were offered by various manufacturers until the end of the 19th century. The term Phantasmagoria Lantern refers to the popular projections of ghostly apparitions in professional shows around 1800. Similar to the apparatus for Phantasmagoria shows, Carpenter's improved Phantasmagoria Lantern could be used as a standing and moving projection device. It did not need wheels, as it was small and light enough to carry around on two side-mounted handles. In, in Carpenter's work, the popular transfer of knowledge takes the place of the popular ghostly apparitions. He only paid little attention to the amusingly creepy potential of moving projection devices for entertaining instructions. He provided an early form of printed and hand-colored slides on various educational topics, which he called copper blade sliders. The copper blade sliders by Carpenter and the successor company, Carpenter and Wesley, are considered a milestone in the history of the magic lanterns. 
lanterns and lantern slides contain the technical and aesthetic potentials of the medium of the art of projection. Instructions from the manufacturers on how to use the lanterns and how to handle different types of screens guided the individual design of performative configurations of, by their clients. Experimental media ecology approaches these practical activities and the possible experiences of the actors and the audience. Our experiments were conducted with three improved phantasmagoria lanterns from different manufacturers and with copper blade sliders from Carpenter and from Carpenter and Wesley. A semi-transparent screen was reconstructed according to instructions from a customer information by Philip Carpenter. In the following, we show and comment the shortened version of a digital presentation of the first series of experiments with improved phantasmagoria lanterns. The presentation is available on the C2DH website and on Vimeo. The timing of our presentation provides only a quick overview. We therefore summarize part of the text orally. We start from the point of the arrangements for basic media, technological and performative experiments. The theater will be divided into three lab spaces. Basic experiments explore the usability of surviving equipment and instructions. So these are the three spaces. Basic experiments explore the usability of surviving equipment and instructions. It begins a process of developing the tacit knowledge needed to conduct the media technological and performative experiments. In the first basic experiments, the projection devices and their use are examined. As a result, two devices are available for media technological experiments. Beyond this, contacts of the light technology that is no longer in use became clear. The basic experiments in lab space two were directed at the reconstruction of the screen according to Carpenter.
The successful reconstruction of the screen also counted some of the experimentation assumptions. We didn't believe it really, that it would work. Here too, the perception of materiality and the need of tacit knowledge shape the experiment. Media technological experiments use the results of the basic experiments. They study the potentials of surviving lanterns and slides to create luminous images on screen. They play open-minded with the image on the screen. And two surviving copper plate sliders are used for projection in the first media technological experiments. The required darkness makes visual documentation at various points impossible. The presentation shows a workaround. The results of the media technological experiments are now permanently available for performative experiments with an audience after Corona. So the first performative experiments play with the appearances on the screen. In addition to the experimenters, two other people could be called in to represent something like an audience. Finally, the spontaneous statement of one of the spectators. That's so the personal experience of the performative and medial events in media archaeological experiments can hardly be replaced by descriptions. These experiences contribute significantly to an understanding of today's screen media. Based on these results so far, we are planning further performative experiments with an audience. Cooperation partners are welcome. Thanks. And under this short 
link, you will find a link tree with two links to the presentation. One link is just the presentation and the other link leads to the website of uh, the DIMA and there we will see more media archaeological experiments with um, 16 millimeter film and with um, um, gramophones, etc. And a media archaeological experiment by Aki. Oh yes, sure. Okay, there must be questions. Yeah, then that's a bit. Thank you, very, very interesting. Uh, I have a question about how do you keep the image in focus when you start moving around, when you are holding the camera, uh, the lantern? Um, this is uh, part, or, or, or the most uh, important part, maybe, uh, of tacit knowledge. You have to train it. And it's interesting that Philip Carpenter writes, you have to train it. Um, so uh, uh, this is different in, in the different lanterns. Uh, in some, you have to move it like this. In, in uh, uh, a newer one, you, can, uh, you have a rack work for that. Uh, but it is not easy to, 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 to hold it in focus. Uh, uh, and when you have it, then you can also use uh, to keep it out of focus. I was, yeah, um, I will go to Sabine, but I was wondering because with the magic lantern on wheels, the phantoscope on wheels, there was like a, a, a combination that, what, what I've seen for like for the Thomas Wainon's uh, phantoscope, that it automatically adjusted when moving. So there's no alternative to that, me mechanical alternative to that, anything. Yeah. We have to know uh, the phantoscope is a professional machine yeah. and uh, the improved phantasmagoria lantern is... Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, the improved phantasm so-called improved phantasmagoria lantern is made for a common market and a mechanism who would adjust this automatically that would have been impossible. And, and this, this is the type of lantern uh, uh, Livingston, for example, used. Sabine had a question, and then Ilya. Thank you, you both, for your very interesting talk. My question concerns the way you use the lantern. We know um, the two f drawings you showed us before. How can you know that Carpenter used, when he projects his zebra, that he used the Japanese method, because what you showed us was a moving lantern that was held in hand, and I always thought that Carpenter was mere the type of, we put the lantern on a podest and then we show it. What are your sources? The, the source is a text by Carpenter. Uh, uh, it is uh, a text from 1823, and he describes, and his, he is not uh, uh, referring to the Japanese method, he is referring to the uh, phantasmagoria, because every phantasmagoria show, show used back projection. It was not possible uh, to do it different. And so, uh, for Carpenter, uh, it, is a, it is a very big part of uh, this uh, uh, customer information, um, how to handle the Phantom Magoria, but with his lights uh, 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 on zoology uh, based on, on the Linnean uh, nomenclature. No, no, uh, uh, it has the handles because that you can move it. And it is, uh, as we said, it is also made for standing. Uh, yes, uh, he said that this is possible. You can uh, use to project it to, uh, onto a white wall. Uh, but he preferred, uh, he, no, he, I don't know what he preferred, but he definitely uh, uses a lot of uh, space to describe how to do the moving projection from behind the screen. And he uses the expression screen uh, but it is still, in, in a way, a word for room divider and for projection surface. Uh, thank you for uh, sharing this with us. Um, uh, from an audience perspective, what took me a bit out of the illusion 
was uh, the the hotspot so that you see uh, the the lamp of, of, of the projectionists. So I was wondering, do you know from historical material, from sources, how the illusionists um, try to circumvene that problem of the hotspot? Or did um, uh, audiences uh, at the 19th century, they didn't bother about the hotspot? So question about oblique angles. <laughs> Exactly, that's it. Um, so these were our first experiments with, uh, uh, we did. And as Ludwig said, as an experimenter, you have to develop the tacit knowledge. Every Lantinist knows this. Uh, you have, it's looking easy, but you have to train it. And um, we realized then also the hotspots, but if you put the lantern a bit in an angle and don't project directly, but a little bit schräg, <laughs> um, then the hot pot disappears. Did they also, did they also use mirrors? Did they use mirrors? Uh, um, no, I don't think so. And we didn't find anything about the reception if people said oh, there was a hot spot and I didn't like it. Um, what happened is when um, Ludwig projected onto the wood of the frame, so uh, I would see the screen. Uh, when he projected into the screen, and when we had really eliminated nearly all the light, the screen disappeared. There was, I couldn't see a screen anymore, and really the image was floating in the air. I've never seen something like that. And then I was thinking about, okay, why I'm projecting and doing Mendelton shows since 35 years. But we also have, um, we have not back projection and we also have lights on the pianist. We have small light, lights on the performer, small light. But in, in the lantern in the room, you always have light in the room. And really at one point of the experiments, Mervyn climbed up everywhere and um, uh, closed the lights. And um, this brought me to some, you know, um, it's really... Um, Things so it's floating in the air like Carpenter describes it and it's really lively and I also had the feeling I would like to stroke the zebra, you know, and it was very nice that the other one also independently also had spontaneously this feeling. Um, and but that means um, the reciter has to speak in the darkness. And has to know every word by heart and also so we didn't believe we really didn't believe the stitches um, we thought maybe the screen is wobbly the frame is wobbly and with a wet screen how should that work and then I thought you know the people so near to the screen they made it because there's not, not enough room on the stitch but when I saw it it just said oh I should go more further Near, more near to the screen. So, Any other questions for first yeah. Three. Three. Yeah. yeah, it's really wonderful to hear about all these effects that came out. But I'm also curious about um, the kind of the use value, kind of insights you might have derived about the pedagogical uses or the kinds of the, you know, the kinds of ways this could be applied and. Um, so this work was part of a research project of other media archaeological experiments and what um, Andreas Vickers um, in Luxembourg and um, help me, Annie van den Uwe in Groningen really want to do is um, to um, include these things into um, in the Lehre, into teaching. Um, so what we really would like to do, we would like to do these performances um, or develop a concept to share these events with an audience uh, in one 
case and the next case would be to develop a concept to bring these experiments into teaching or into museums or into whatever um, because you know you you have really to like a magic lantern show too you all know it or the real thing as Nela always says you have to experience it we have time for a last question Nicholas was begging and then we have to round up or take and test it knowledge outside. Thank you for this um, amazing reenactment. I think it has to be seen in the live to really fully appreciate it. Uh, I have two small questions. Uh, one of the slides mentioned you have to uh, attach the device to the body, but do I understand it correctly? We have so they, has, they had some kind of harness to attach it to, or is it really uh, hold uh, manually? So that was my first one. And the second one, uh, I was intrigued by the wet sheet uh, method, but does it uh, affect the, um, the the view? I mean, do you have a different view if it's dry than when the sheet is wet? Thank you. Um, yes, they attached uh, the lantern to the body. Uh, I did it with a belt uh, uh, that I could do it away immediately. And uh, I wear a welter's jacket, uh, so um, uh, this, it's difficult to discuss this question uh, uh, for this dissemination. Uh, we would not be allowed in every theater uh, to use open fire. And, and still, uh, it is also dangerous for, for the experimenter. I did not burn my fingers, uh, but I did before, so I was very careful. Here. And, <laughs> and so... Uh, um, this is really uh, putting the medium to the body. This is a, it is a bodily experience. And uh, yes, the wet, uh, it's, it's, it's great to, do, to operate open fire and water together. And um, yes, it makes an effect uh, when the screen is going to dry, it becomes less transparent, but it takes nearly 40, 50 minutes, uh, you can operate very well. And so it's experimental Yes, yes, it's, yeah. it's very lamp. Yeah. Um, just to add to two, 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 three points, Sabine asked about um, how the lantern was used. Was it put on a table or was it handheld like a Japanese style projection? And you also asked about um, focusing the lens to make it a clear picture on the screen. The idea of the carpenter lantern in 1823 was to hold the lantern with a belt on your body so that you could use your both hands to focus the lantern. And there's one lantern in Darmstadt in the Landesmuseum, and it has two, um, it's not a, a something, a type of to hold the hand, lantern by hand. It's far too small, the little, um, I don't know, the, the ears. They are made to put a belt, a leather belt, into the lantern so that the lantern is on your body, and you don't need to touch the lantern because it will be too hot anyway to hold in your fingers. And I've seen two lanterns, but it changed very shortly after the launch of the Carpenter Lantern. So the very early lanterns have this device. Just to add it, it solves the question of focusing, and it solves the question of the heat. So, new insights. <laughs> It only, uh, yes, we used the belt, but we, we, we didn't use it uh, uh, that you cannot remove uh, the lantern immediately from the body for safety reasons. Um, but also, when you have the belt like that, uh, you, 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 you need one hand to stabilize the lantern. And uh, you have the other hand, it depends on if you're left or right-handed, then you have the other hand uh, for handling uh, the focus. This, this is uh, how it works when you are using this type of lantern. And 
it is not that you have it on your body and, and, and uh, both hands at, uh, at the lens. It wouldn't make no sense anyway, because with one hand you have to stabilize uh, the device. And, and you have to move the slide also. And you also have to move the slide. Yes. Uh, you, you should try it. <laughs> Very, very last, last few steps. <laughs> so I, I have two of the earliest uh, carpenter lanterns which uh, strap very tight directly to your belly. So I, I, I agree with, uh, with, uh, with Bernd that he actually the left hand, uh, one of the hands is for keeping the focus because it's a, it's a continuous tube. So it doesn't have any kind of rack work uh, focusing. It's just a sliding tube where you have to put a little bit oil so that it slides very, very smoothly. And the other hand is for just operating this long uh, copper braid slider. So I, I've tried many times tightening it to my body. I wish I could bring the, the lantern to Europe so that it could, we could actually try this because I have the correct lenses also in it. And I have the, also the whale oil lamp, which it's originally used. So the, um, so the oil is another question, you know, like what kind of oil did you use? Because Carpenter says in his, actually there are two, two versions of that illustration. The early illustration is what you show, and a few years later they show the guy actually holding it in his hand. So it, it's funny. So they probably, it wasn't probably good that first original version. I think everything you say needs experimental proof. Yep. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Further debate later on uh, about the use of oil, not Russian oil, I assume. Um, <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think